Tony, good morning. How are you, my man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So you, uh, you've you written this book about your father, who it turns out was a big-time drug smuggler. I mean, they, he, he earned something like 5 or $6 million throughout his career. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, you know, he made a good amount of money, but he also he spread a lot of uh, product. Uh, you know, it wasn't cocaine, which is why the figure is not astronomical profit-wise, uh, you know, he, uh, but he, you know, he sold millions upon millions of joints uh, in a single load. I think in '86, uh, he sold enough to a roll of joint for every college age kid in America. <laughs> yeah, he he, did fifty tons of of marijuana he smuggled into the United States throughout. Yeah, at his least career. fifty tons. And what's what's unique about him, I discovered, is that his career was a long one. You know, a lot of people got in, they did one big job, and they got out. Uh, they made their nut, and they invested it in a bar, or whatever. He started in the very early 1970s, 71, uh, and did nothing else until 1992. <laughs> so uh, you were gr you grew up with him. You guys ended up in Miami, moved to Miami, which seems to be like a good place to, to run drugs from. Um, you had no idea as a child that your father was doing any of this, though, correct? Yeah, that's totally correct. I mean, I was essentially part of his cover story. You know, uh, friends asked me what my father did. I thought he sold real estate in Vermont, or maybe he was a boat captain. You know, he had a charter boat captain uh, license. Uh, I had no idea that the private school and the car and the boat and the vacations were all funded by uh, you know his his sales machine in uh, in New York, in New England. Uh, I didn't find that out until I was on the brink of becoming a father myself, and I decided to um, investigate some rumors in the family. Uh, and I, I called the National Archives, uh, and they had a criminal record on my father. Uh, you know, the New England Drug Task Force, one of these big uh, rings uh, that Reagan created to bust um, drug uh, groups. Um, you know, it, it brought a case against them. You know, 17 tons in a single job he did in '86, and they they put him in prison for it along with a bunch of other people. You. Um did you live a life of luxury growing up as a child because of this all this money that he was making? Well, when you're a kid, you don't you just live the life that you've been born into. You have no idea. But in retrospect, yeah, it was nice. You know, I had a passport with a lot of stamps in it. We went on cruises. Uh, I went to a very fancy private school with uh, George Bush's uh, grandkids, uh, and you know, I never wanted for anything. Uh, and then, you know, when the the law came and the the money was lost, uh, we moved to Maryland. Uh, and it was a very different picture. I was suddenly the kid who didn't have as much money as the other guy. Did your mother know what was going on throughout this entire period of time? Did she know your dad was a big-time drug smuggler? Uh, I mean, she. There are points in which she ceased to know, but from the beginning, she knew. She was. Uh, it was a loan from her father that gave my fa my father the the nut he needed to buy in for his first job. So she believed in it. She believed in marijuana. She thought the government was wrong to, to ban it, and she so she thought it was spreading peace and love, and you know, expanded mindfulness, all that kind of stuff. Was there a lot of danger to what your father was doing? I, mean, I, would, I would assume that you would run into some characters that could be violent or some some uh, some bad guys in the drug trade. Well, no, right? So, you know, one of his cardinal rules, uh, and the cardinal rules of his friends, was that you just don't get involved with cocaine. You know, cocaine is a soul killer, uh, and cocaine, uh, cocaine dealers are just a different kind of criminal, and you don't want to be mixed up in it. And a lot of drug, uh, a lot of marijuana dealers from the 70s, uh, like George Young, the guy from Blow, he made the jump to cocaine. You make more money, it's easier, it's safer, uh, each smuggle is safer. But you have to associate with, like you said, I mean, these really just dirty characters who do anything. Uh, and my father didn't want to be part of that. You know, he wanted to be the smiley-eyed uh, marijuana man. So he, he does this for a number of years. He makes a bunch of money. And my understanding is that he got out of it for a period of time and then re-entered and did uh, some more big jobs. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you do something for enough years in a row, uh, you realize that you really don't have the skills for anything else. You can't change. It's not like he could, after year 15 in the drug business, drop a resume on someone's desk and be like, you know what, I think I want to go teach school now. Well, what did you do for the last 15 years? Who are your employers? Let me call your references. It becomes harder and harder to get out of the business. And then also your nervous system gets a, you know, a bit addicted to it. I mean, I'm sure you can understand this as a guy on the radio. It feels good. It's, a, it's kind of a hit. It's a pop. It feels uh, it's exciting. The nerves tingle. You go in the air. You, you do your job. For him, you, you, know, you deal several tons of marijuana, and that's a rush. You beat the cops. You beat the president. You beat everybody. And you can't walk away from that. It's a thrill. So when, when he tried to retire, it was like 
he closed off a, a very important part of himself. He didn't felt he didn't feel like the same man. Uh, Tony Ducopel is on with us. His book is called "The Last Pirate: A Father, His Son, and the Golden Age of Marijuana." His dad was a big time drug smuggler back in what is this the seventies, eighties, and nineties roughly? Is that the yeah, period? He started in the seventies and uh, he he worked consistently until the mid eighties, and then there was a washout period that got us into the nineties. <laughs> did uh, did he ever get? Now, obviously, he ended up going to prison, you mentioned, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But did he ever get, prior to that, that, that New England drug task force uh, that, that busted him, did he ever come close to getting caught? Did he, Or was he ever caught? Uh, I mean, yeah, how, I mean, how did he get away with all are, this? Yeah, they're, to- they're very much close calls, and that's kind of why these guys are in the business. I mean, they, I, you know, my, my reading of the situation is that they're adrenaline junkies. They're like guys who do base jumping or skydiving. They want to flirt with oblivion, uh, and oblivion means getting busted. So, you know, in the 70s, my father, uh, although organizationally he didn't need to do this, and he didn't need to do it for money, he was driving Winnebago's full of weed out of Key West. So one of his partners had a connection that could get the, the dope dropped to a fishing house way out in Key West, south of Miami. Uh, and and then someone had to pick it up at the fishing house and drive it to the mainland, and there's only one road from Key West into Florida, and mm-hmm. you know the cops know that that's a smuggling route. And so to put a big-ass Winnebago on the road full of this stuff uh, is just asking for trouble. It's just rolling the dice. Uh, and he did that again and again just for the thrill of it. Uh, and it's, you know, he comes close to getting caught, and, and that's the point. Would he take you along with you when he did that as sort of a cover, like here I am, a guy with my son, we're just going on a fishing trip or something? No, I, I wish in a way. You know, I, um, you know, when I, when I, you know, we were out of contact for years and years and years. And then, part of what I did with this book is I, I, I went to his, where he lives now, and I, I spent some time with him. And you know, part of what I regretted, I realized, is that I was not in on the conspiracy. You know, if he had made me a confidant, if I'd felt like a partner or like I was enjoying the good time, uh, and it wasn't a lie, then I, you know, I think my feelings about the whole situation would be different. But the fact that it was, you know, it was kept even from me. It just just put a sour taste in my mouth. Um, how would he get the? Uh, I mean, well, how would he do this exactly? He'd get the drugs from Mexico or something, and and they would. Yeah, well, you know, they started in, people started in Mexico, uh, and then Mexican weed got a reputation for being just terrible relative to what Jamaica and Colombia was producing. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is before the the what we have today, where everyone's growing it in the warehouses, and and you know, forget about soil and sunlight. Um, so Mexico kind of fell off the, the charts in terms of a market that people wanted to smoke. Everyone wanted Colombian. High Times Magazine had a top 40 list, and like everything on there was Colombian. Everyone wants Colombian. You get a big, big money for that. So uh, a part of his goes to uh, Santa. Uh, he goes to the uh, – there's a part of Colombia that's uh, – it's, it's on the border of Venezuela, and it, like, punches into the Caribbean. It's on the uh, – not on the California side. Uh, and you go to the mountains there, and the farmers bring it right out to you. Uh, and you make your order, you pick it up. It's like the America's warehouse for marijuana in those days. Uh, and then it gets put on a big old uh, tanker or an old tugboat that's fitted for, for transport of this kind. Uh, and it goes to a location in the, in the Caribbean where sailboats meet it, and then it gets divvied up. It's the mothership model. Uh, and then the sailboats make landfall uh, at the States, and my father's the first guy in America who touches the stuff. Uh, he's got the stash, out, stash house network uh, and then uh, trucks to, to make deliveries, and he knows you know, the eight or ten guys in the New York City area, for example, who could sell a ton at a time. And he would call those guys and say, pick it up. What do you think the biggest deal he ever made was uh, for a, a shipment of marijuana? Well, that 17-ton job in 1986 was the biggest, and the reason that they settled on 17 tons was because it's 35,000 pounds, and the feds used to say that that was the equivalent of a single day's supply of dope in America. So, you know, it's probably a bogus number like everything else in the drug war, but that was that was the number that got tossed around. So it was like, hey, let's do a single day. Uh, let's be the guys. You, it sounds like you don't believe in the, the war on drugs that America has been fighting for decades. I mean, I've got a mixed, it's, it's, it's laughable in a way. You know, I've got this clip I keep at my desk here uh, from 1982. It's a New York Times article. Uh, which describes uh, a boat with a small amount of marijuana on it evading uh, a Coast Guard cutter, a Navy destroyer, and four jet fighters for 27 hours. And you just think, oh, my God, some guy on a fishing boat with a, you know, a bale of dope is being pursued by the same jets that we surveilled the Soviets with in the 80s. I and mean, that's crazy. 
Uh, and yet, I mean, I think the overall intention of, uh, of the war on drugs had some merit to it. I mean, I, I think you need, I think culturally it does serve the society to, to have a message of, uh, you know, do less, do less now, drug abuse. Um, my understanding, and I might be wrong about this, my understanding is that he, well, or, or what you told me, it sounded like this is what you said, that he kind of got out of this and then someone ratted him out or, or turned him in for something that happened years earlier, uh, and that's how he got busted? Is that accurate? Yeah, that is. So it, it's a very important point of pride for my father. He was never caught, right? He never got caught in his mind. He was turned in. And that's a really important distinction, evidently, in the criminal world. Uh, you know, the cops never confiscated his bails. They never had a photo op where, the, you know, some guy's got his foot on a big bail and they've got a press conference and the drugs are on the table, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Never happened. So that's success in his view. Um, but uh, the, his partner, who got the, the dope from Colombia, got pinched in Portugal in 91 uh, and then quickly cooperated, and the guy who was brought on to corroborate, corroborate the first guy's story, and this is unbelievable melodrama, is my stepfather. So my stepfather and my father's other partner turned on my father, uh, sent him to jail, sent nine other guys to the jail, and then, and then uh, also gave birth to three other overlapping indictments. I mean, it was a huge ring of, of friends. It was a confederacy, is what the feds called it. How many years after the fact did, did he get busted for this then? Yeah, so this is the thing that really sticks in my father's mind about this. Is, um, he, he, you know, the statute of limitations, this was, this was for a crime before 87 uh, when the laws changed. But anyway, that's too technical. The statute of limitations was one week away from being up, meaning he'd be free and clear. Uh, and that's the week he gets busted. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, this is uh, this is an incredible story that uh, Tony has lived through. Tony Ducopal is his name. He's written a book called The Last Pirate, A Father, His Son, and the Golden Age of Marijuana. The book is out in stores now. Is he out of jail now? He went to prison, I'm assuming. Uh, how long did he spend in there, and is he out now? He did go to prison. He was there for about 18 months. Uh, why so uh, little time? Uh, because my father was a rat as well, you know. He, uh, he didn't want to... He didn't want to do a hefty sentence, so he cooperated where he could. Um, additionally, his crime was before the sentencing reform of 87, where mandatory minimums came on board. Uh, if it had been an 87 job, he would have got a minimum of 10 years. Uh, anyway, so he got out. Uh, the, he was busted by the New England Drug Task Force, so he did federal time in Boston, in Massachusetts. Uh, and, and that's where he lives now. He lives near Cambridge, uh, near Harvard University. Uh, and, you know, he's always been a bit of a romantic. That's why I call it the golden age of marijuana. And he, you know, he toodles around Harvard and uh, falls in the grass and watches the girls roller skate and the, <laughs> hangs out by the Charles River, wanders into bookstores. He's got a wonderful life. How, what, what about all the money that he, he said he earned about <laughs> six million bucks? What happened to all that? <laughs> Uh, you know, I was disinherited in the hotel rooms of Miami, one uh, line of cooking at a time, uh, one call to the to the escort service at a time. Um, you know, he had a my father's theory of criminal life is that it should it should rise dramatically and fall dramatically. So uh, he spent it all in one final uh, <laughs> final push of uh, just absolute. Uh, dissolution. I mean, he ended up homeless at one point in the late 80s. So he made $6 million or $5 million or whatever it was throughout the course of this. Uh, and you're telling me he pretty much just blew it on cocaine and hookers. That's exactly what happened. I mean, he just fired his flare. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's I mean, it's totally extraordinary. Typical. It's totally typical. It's totally typical. I, you know, there are very few guys from that era and every single smuggler or dealer who I've interviewed over the course journalistically for the book you know separately uh, anyone I run across I'm like do you know anyone who got out you don't have to tell me who it is but do you know anyone who succeeded in taking their nest egg from that business and investing in something legitimate and and I've yet to find someone I mean I'm sure that person exists but the general trajectory was make a lot lose a lot and if they did if they did do that they probably don't want to talk about how they made their money <laughs> illegal and, and now they're they're legit well it it kind of goes to show you that it sounds like your father he must have had a degree of intelligence to be able to do this for this number of years and not get caught and make that kind of money and it sounds like a fairly sophisticated operation so there was a level of intelligence that went into it, but then there's also a level of stupidity that uh, that, that you blow this five or six million dollars on 
hookers and cocaine. You know, it's it's yeah, literally nothing of value. I mean, yeah. literally nothing of value. I, he doesn't even know where some of the money went. He had a safe uh, deposit box in in Miami where he kept at least six figures. Uh, and at a certain point, he just couldn't access it anymore, you know, because he didn't have his ID. He lost that, uh, and he couldn't get in. And so he's like, ah, oh, fuck it. You know, so he, it. So he doesn't even know where it is. So yeah, there could so be money, money buried, buried he someplace. Know where it is. I, you know, part of the, I'm, yeah, there could be money buried right now. There could be money buried right now. I mean, on Long Island, he buried a bunch of money, and, uh, uh, you know, my, one of my mother's friends whose property the money was, was buried on, uh, you know, she says every time he buried money, he bought a new shovel, and I have a lot of shovels. <laughs> Wow. I mean, this is a this is an extraordinary story. The book is called the, the Last Pirate, A Father, His Son, and the Golden Age of Marijuana. What do you do, uh, Tony? What do, I mean, what do you do for a career? You're a writer? I'm or something? a journalist. Yeah, I'm a journalist. I work for NBC News. I'm, I'm in 30 Rock right now talking to you. Oh, all right. So you're out in New York. What do you normally work on all day? I mean, you, you're a journalist, but what kind of stuff? I mean, do you go out, you write stories, you write stuff for the, the, for the, the nightly news, like the TV, or what do you do? It's a mix of things, uh, you know. So the, you try to get your stories on nightly, but I also write kind of magazine style pieces. Uh, it's a lot like drug dealing. I make big promises. They give me money. I go out in the field. I try to get it. <laughs> if I come back, we deal it out. <laughs> well, uh, the book sounds uh, great. The Last Pirate. It's available in stores right now. Uh, Tony DeCopel. Tony, I appreciate you coming on the show, and good luck with the book, my man. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Tony DeCopel.